Last time we tried to bring together several threads, U.S. drug policy and its causes, the patronage system of the pre and its decline, and the rise of drug trafficking organizations that no longer played by the same rules of the game. These different trends go a long way in explaining the rise of violence that took place uh, over the last 10 to 15 years in Mexico. We'll return to these factors throughout this course, but in today's video, I would like to talk a bit more theoretically about something we've mentioned, but not confronted directly, the notion of corruption. What do we mean when we say that the pre-constructed a system of corruption which allowed the drug trade to grow? What does the term corruption really mean? So what I'd like you to do is actually pause the video, take out a piece of paper, and I'd like you to answer this question. Try to answer this question. Corruption. What is it? Okay. So one of the things that Americans tend to think about corruption is that it has to do with its roots in dishonesty and even can be seen as immoral. But I actually want to try to argue against this, at least in part. I'm not saying that corruption is good, but only that when understood in a distinctly Mexican context, it loses some of its moral aspects, or at least the historical context relativizes the actions of individuals a bit. Scholar Claudio Lomnitz has done some good work on the history of corruption in Mexico, and much of what follows is adapted from his own findings. To begin, we need to look at the relations of power that were created during the colonial period. First, church and state. During the colonial era, officials that served in the colonial government were appointed by the crown. They obtained their position from the crown as a reward for past favors or because they were in a certain social class. These were not civil servants uh, ruling for the betterment of the people. They were expected to actually profit from their positions. So the crown gave individuals the opportunity to serve in the government knowing full well that this individual would perhaps enrich himself from tax revenues of the crown skimmed off the top. Or perhaps in agricultural arrangements that could uh, he could ne negotiate to his benefit. So corruption in this sense, back in the colonial era uh, in Mexico, was the appropriation of the state's re resources for individual use. The church was not immune to this as well. The church raised its own taxes in the ways of tithes and could appoint officials to different posts. Now, one could definitely argue that this situation was to the detriment of the crown, but the church leadership and uh, the people, but this was a common practice and to some extent survived after the colonial period. So second, we need to th think about the idea of ritual we need to understand a second aspect of the history of corruption. In addition to officials profiting from their position by appropriating wealth of the state or the church, we also have the people in the colonial era. In a colonial system that is set up not to benefit you, your leaders are not civil servants, you need to have leverage as well. This leverage or the power that people could exert over their leaders to get them to help was often found in ritual. For example, in a village, local saints' days were celebrated, and citizens were the ones to shoulder most of the cost for these celebrations. This took place in indigenous regions as well as those populated by mestizos, those of mixed indigenous and Spanish heritage. The church wanted these fiestas to be celebrated because they contributed to the loyalty of the church and also to church authority. But what would happen if they didn't celebrate? The church might look pretty stupid, as well as the prestige of the crown and the town also uh, not being held in high esteem. So people put out their money for the fiestas, and the church in turn gave its support and showered the town with its protection, with its services, and with perhaps new priests or something of the sort. The state also had these kind of rituals as well. What we have here is the idea that People gave loyalty through ritual, obedience, etc., and officials were therefore obligated to give patronage. How, how this, according to Lomnitz, has survived into, into the modern era is the idea that political loyalties are forged through material benefits. 
For instance, it was a common practice throughout the pre-era for the party to show up in a town and give everyone Walmart gift cards. This was even reported in some of some recent elections. The people responded by voting for the pre, right? Patronage uh, is given, and in res response, people give loyalty. This might be called corruption, but it's a little more complex than just a problem of morality, right? Moreover, let's talk about the basic picture of corruption that many Americans have in their minds. I can share my own story. When I was around 10 years old or so, I went with my father and a church group down to Mexico to help build a church in the northern state of Chihuahua. As we were driving over the border, we were stopped by a Mexican border guard official, um, and everyone else was uh, waved through except for my dad and myself. Apparently, because of a rash of kidnappings where Mexican, where American parents uh, would take children away from their spouse and head down to Mexico, if one parent had a minor with them and the other parent wasn't there, there had to be a notarized letter from the other parent saying that everything was okay. My dad apparently didn't get that memo, and we didn't have that letter. And so I remember the scene. My dad was totally frustrated, and this guy, this border guard, was not going to let us go. We returned to the van to talk to one of the trip leaders who had been to Mexico many times, and he told him the story, and he just said, well, just give him 20 bucks and everything should be fine. So my dad awkwardly took out 20 bucks and, uh, and sort of slid it into the passport, and then um, the guy essentially let us go. So what about this? Can we in any way relate this to what I've just explained? I think we can. Let's start by talking about what this, this was. This is a bribe, essentially. But literally in Spanish, it's called the mordida, or the bite. It means that this official was appointed, given a salary that was well below living standard, and he was basically expected implicitly to take a bite out of the revenues that came his way. When this Within the system, that's just how it worked. It's not explicitly immoral, right? The guy could see our situation, that we were a church group, that my dad wasn't kidnapping me away from my mom. He could, in good conscience, take my dad's money as a kind of tax for not having the right papers and send us on our way. Some scholars note that a country's lack of political competition and a large role for government in the economy increases corruption. This is basically because the lack of political choice usually is accompanied by a lack of transparency over government where appropriation of funds can take place. Also, with the uncompetitive political state involved in the economy, there are more chances for this corruption to take place as well. The PRI fit pretty well into most of this for most of its history, a one-party system with little competition politically and a heavy intervention in the economy. The theory is that a country increases its political competitive competitiveness, um, when they do that, there will be less room for corrupt practices by state employees. Essentially, more transparency, when there's more transparency, there's less incentive to do things people might not agree with if everyone can see what's being done. Because if everyone can see what's being done and vote somebody out of power, right, then that increases um, the, the likelihood that there will be less corrupt practices all along the chain. Democratic leaders have more likelihood of being replaced. But it's not the whole story. Partially democratized societies can actually be some of the places where corruption is most felt. Just think about the Mexican situation. As the pre fell apart, so did a lot of the patron-client networks that had been set up. The party wasn't able to buy loyalty as much anymore. In some ways, we might argue that drug trafficking organizations have filled the patronage vacuum left by the PRI, where once the PRI could allow a state employee to take a mordida, drug traffickers offer something much more compelling, plata or plomo, silver or lead, a bribe or a bullet. This is a complex web, especially when low public employee salaries are the norm in Mexico. Policemen, army officials, etc. are all part of a system where there is a basic cultural context of profiting at the state's expense. Now you throw in billions of dollars and the threat of violence into the system and the weakening of the state control over the system itself 
And I think you can get a better understanding of the context in which some of this quote unquote corruption happens uh, with regard to the drug trade. But that's not to say that corruption of this sort doesn't exist elsewhere, and especially in the United States. We need only to look to the United States' history to see a similar uh, situation when there's a lack of transparency, that's when corruption is enabled to exist. And so fighting corruption is really about promoting transparency, promoting accountability for our elected officials. Thanks. That's all I have for you today.